the top. One is yes, indeed. And will all be um, putting the case. And ten is uh, a new paradise. I'm looking for a little differentiation. We yeah. can all be all right. some level of optimistic, but it'll help a little bit if we have a sense of okay. who's staking out a slightly different position. Ready to go? <laughs> So if you let us, I'm sure we'll each say a number and then see who qualifies. I'll, pay, and I'll, I'll give you about 10 seconds to qualify, and then I'll ask the next person. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. I'm planning for 10 seconds, then. I, I already okay. know. Okay. Gone. So you're going to... Um, direct questions or ask for I will, yes. Uh, Good we'll evening, go everybody. We'll get started. Half an hour of Q&A. And Thank thank you very much for being with us. Forth. You don't always have to take the cue from On me. On this beautiful San Francisco evening, we have a, a treat in store for us. My name is Karen Tucker. I am CEO at the Churchill Club. And our program tonight is called Global Growth Trends and the Productivity Imperative and here to address what they believe matters most around this topic for the times ahead, we're privileged to have a remarkable group of speakers. We have Jana Reams from McKinsey Global Institute. We have Paul Thomas from Intel. And we have Hal Varian from Google. And of course, our moderator, George Anders from Forbes. Welcome and thank you all so much for being with us tonight. We wish to also thank our partners, McKinsey Global Institute, particularly Rebecca Raboy, and Wharton San Francisco, particularly Doug Collum, for co-hosting this program. We couldn't have done it without you, and you really deserve applause as well, so thank you. A few words about Churchill Club. Our mission as a nonprofit operating in the Bay Area for the last 29 years is to encourage innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. And we do this through the up to 40 programs that we present each year, where we bring people together uh, on the stage, people with like minds to exchange ideas and to meet one another. And we do respectfully ask our speakers to refrain from repeating things that they have said in other forums, but rather to push themselves to adv advance collective understanding and to inspire others to positive action. We're particularly interested in the implications of today's technology-related trends for opportunities tomorrow, particularly relative to innovation and economic growth. New April programs are coming soon, addressing the future of internet connectivity in the US on April 7. Intel Capital uh, President Arvind Sodani, together with Silicon Valley Bank CEO Greg Becker on April 13 and the future of TV after there is no TV uh, on April 23rd. And then our 17th annual Top 10 Tech Trends event will occur on May 21st. So visit us often, please, at churchillclub.org and stay up to date on the programs that we're presenting. If you're tweeting, please use the hashtag Churchill Club, and you will find other Twitter codes in your printed programs. And let me now call up our partner, Doug Collum, the Vice Dean of Wharton, San Francisco. So welcome to everybody and welcome to Wharton San Francisco. You know, I live in Menlo Park, so I appreciate the ordeal it takes to drive up here. If you're coming from the South Bay, it's like hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, you know, the traffic just gets worse. And um, so it's all the more the appreciation that I'm, I'm expressing here for people being here in the audience tonight. Um, sorry? And we need snow. <laughs> There's no snow. <laughs> Um, you know, my thanks also to the Churchill Club, which is the organizing um, organization here. It's really a remarkable process that Karen and her team bring to this. So our thanks to you, Karen, for doing this. And also to, the, to McKenzie and Company and to the Global Institute for um, effectively providing a, the anchor and the content that's represented in the panel tonight. Um, you know, when Karen contacted me and said, geez, we'd we be interested in co-hosting this event. I mean, you should know, I mean, Wharton um, is a business school and the research and teaching done by faculty has been principally in the area of finance. And so when she made the offer and said, would you be interested in co-hosting? The answer is, it's a, like a trick question. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, anything that has to do with productivity and capital 
and innovation and technology and labor. I mean, this is what Wharton is all about. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the campus here, um, the campus has been on the West Coast for 14 years. Uh, up until about three years ago, we were in the Folger Coffee Building. Now we're in the historic Hills Brothers Coffee Building. <laughs> we, we only do historic coffee buildings. Um, the core ac academic program here is the MBA program for executives. Um, and this is really for executives and managers from all over the West Coast who are interested in earning an MBA from an Ivy League institution while they work. Um, so I always get to ask this question, how many people here in the audience tonight are Wharton alumni or students? Ooh. How many of you are here um, on behalf of McKenzie and Company? Great. And how many here are members are on behalf of the Churchill Club? Boy, this is, I, this is a wonderful audience. It is, I have to say, it is a real privilege for us to have you here. So thank you all for coming up. Um, and what I'd like to do now quickly is turn this over to George Anders and let him take over. Thank you so much. So we have an engaged audience tonight, and I want to make the most of this. So we're going to start with the mood of the house. Um, think about your own attitudes toward productivity, the long-term economic outlook. You're going to have three choices. How many people are fundamentally optimistic Prosperity comes and uh, you're feeling good about where we're headed over the next 10 to 30 years. Hands up. Okay, that is a good turnout. How many people are ambivalent? There's a lot to feel good about, but there's some worries, sustainability, what have you, that won't go away. Okay, so that's, I'm just going to say 60%, 25% or so. How many people are survivalists with at least six months of food in a bunker? <laughs> okay, we have a survivalist, good. Um, I, I may impersonate a survivalist momentarily just to keep the dialogue going. Um, so with that in mind, I want to give each of the panelists a chance to frame the issue your way. Um, what's your case for optimism? What's your case for pessimism? Which side do you end up on? Uh, Jana, you get to start. Um, very shortly, I think I'm with Lagarde. I think it's the new mediocre. It's not because I don't think the opportunity is not there. I, th I just think it's going to take a lot of action from a lot of people and a lot of different parts of the world to keep, uh, keep the growth going. I hope it will happen, but I'm not sure it will. Perfect. Paul? I guess I'm, I'm an optimist, and that shouldn't be surprising if you work for a high-tech firm in Silicon Valley. Um, but I look at a couple of things. One is in the early 90s, there didn't seem to be much productivity growth, the famous comment, I see computers everywhere except in the productivity numbers that uh, Robert Solow said. And, and then the, the productivity showed itself. Uh, there are other reasons historically to think that we don't necessarily know what's coming. Mm -hmm. For those of us who forecast for a living, uh, maybe feel a little foolish about that. But we don't know what's coming. And I do think that the right things are being done in places like Silicon Valley and around the world to plant the seeds for very large, impressive technological gains. When I worry a little, it's that we may have set up some rules and policies that make it hard because there, is, there really is dis, uh, destructive competition. It really does tend to sweep the old out when the new comes in. And if we can't, if we're too worried to allow that to happen, we might stifle growth. Mm -hmm. Hal? Yeah, I'm also a, an optimist. And, and one of the things that's made me optimistic was reading the uh, McKinsey report. Uh, I thought the greatest uh, number in there was the 75% of potential productivity growth comes from disseminating best practices, that is, existing practices. And it made me think of the William Gibson quote that the future has already arrived, it's just unevenly distributed. So the fact that we could distribute these productivity enhancing technologies to the rest of the world means autom virtually automatic growth, uh, assuming the uh, political and economic system welcomes those innovations. We should not take it for granted, but I think it will work out that way. So when we were doing our prep call for this, we ended up in a conversation about how much innovation is going to come from within 50 miles of where we sit, and how much is going to come from other, perhaps unexpected locations. Uh, Yana, you're outnumbered. You've got two people who get their paychecks from Silicon Valley, so they kind of have to argue locally. Can you make the case that innovation's global and we may not be the, the center of everything? I can. I mean, you, are, you gave me a side to argue, so I will argue that side. Um, the number of reasons, and mostly it is the fact that 
roughly two thirds of the global economy is services. And a lot of the jobs, particularly out there, are jobs that are relatively low tech. Take healthcare. This is the sector that's growing in emerging markets at very, very rapid rates. They are starting without a system. They don't have a hospital uh, network around it. They can actually innovate and do things better than we do. And they already do. There is an Aravind Eye Care, for example, is the world's largest eye care facility. They operate um, as many uh, patients as I mean, two thirds of the number of patients at the UK national health system. And they do it more productively, significantly more productively, and they do it with fewer uh, infections. And that is partly because they have completely redesigned the process. They have uh, lean applications, if you want, on the healthcare. And what they do is that they have 70% of the operation room is, is done and operated by technicians who are very specialized and very skilled in what they do. So I think particularly the areas that are the challenge for us, which is healthcare, some of the other service sectors that, have, that are, if you will, not, not market driven, there's huge opportunities for real innovation and growth coming from those segments. Great. The eye care example, if I remember right, that's South India, correct? Yes, absolutely. Okay, yes. yeah, just want to make sure everyone knew the location. Oh, yeah. Uh, Paul? Well, I want to say that um, we, we may have our headquarters in Santa Clara, but a, an awful lot of innovation takes place in other parts of Intel, including other countries. So I don't think just the fact that we're 50 miles away makes us think that's where most of the innovation is coming from. Right, for example, there's a very uh, fun and popular rivalry between the, uh, the group in Israel and the group in Hillsborough, Oregon, about who can solve the most difficult problems the best way. And frequently, we, we throw the problems to both of them and let them have some competition. So Hillsborough is more than 50 miles away, but it's still a US-centric uh, uh, point of view, I guess. But Israel is not. And we also rely on breakthroughs all around the world. You know, the model of um, you know, 40 engineers in a modem that people used to talk about, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily get all the gains. that you, you don't necessarily have to be in the same place anymore because of the technology that the firms in Silicon Valley have managed to develop, you, you want people to be all around the world. So I was in Hillsborough some years ago and I remember being told that the toughest problems are given to the newest hires and the youngest people because they have no idea what's impossible yeah. and they end up pursuing <laughs> solutions that everyone else doesn't. Is that something you still do? I hadn't, heard, I hadn't heard that, but I like it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Hal, uh, someone's got to defend the 650. Can you give a shot at it? Well, I, I would take a different angle. I would say that the uh, smartest person in the world is in probably in China or India or Africa, and they're stuck behind a plow. And so 20 years ago, that talent would conceivably go to waste, but now that person can access the internet. Right? They can access every book ever written, potentially, they can within take the next few edX years. They or Coursera courses. And, and uh, they can take Coursera courses. They, they have access to a much, much broader uh, world. And I think uh, enabling that creativity, enabling the, the, the talent uh, pool to really thrive in the world has got to lead to uh, a better world, in my view. Mm -hmm. So this uh, era of global communications is really uh, enabling a lot of talent to become noticed that otherwise would never be noticed. Uh, you mentioned agriculture, and I think we tend to forget in the U.S., um, because we've pretty much moved everyone off the farms, how much of world labor is still um, in the fields. Jana, can you talk a bit about that? I think you had some interesting findings in your report. Absolutely. It's one of the biggest opportunities in the emerging world because of the fact that so many people still work on that industry. And it clearly is one area where very simple things of just moving from draft animals to tractors and mechanizing many of, many of, many of the other, other steps can make a huge difference. But interestingly, I think in agriculture, we tend to think about it that everything has been done in the US, but it's actually an area where, where Silicon Valley and other high-tech hubs here are making a big difference. We estimate that about we could see in the U.S. agricultural productivity about 10 to 20 percent uh, rise in, in productivity simply from precision agriculture, having the sensors, having the analysis of how exactly are your fields doing in the different parts of the, of the field and applying the right kind of uh, fertilizers, water, whatever they need. So I think it is a much more exciting field that people think about. Actually, I don't know if you knew, but they estimate that the biggest market for drones will be agriculture. Really? I would have yes. thought that would keep migrating people out. But I think that... Uh, for drones. Oh, for drones. I'm yes. sorry, I heard Drones. Oh, okay, okay. I, I know Vinod Kostla has some sort of automatic carrot picker that he contends will mean the end of migrant labor. And 
being Vinod, of course, he projects amazing things for it. But uh, Actually, that's a very interesting point about the agricultural labor in California. Traditionally, we have had a lot of migrant labor coming there. But now, there is not as fast population growth in places like Mexico, which means that there aren't as many young people born in the rural areas who are willing to come and work on the fields. So we already have one of uh, your colleagues in Berkeley looking at for example, the shortage of farm labor in California. And so I think it may well be that this is not just replacing folks, but it is, there's just not going to be a supply for those folks. Hal, you had mentioned your family goes back to the apple orchard business. So <laughs> true. Get, offer me your take from the ground up on agriculture. Well, I, I'm, I'm one of that 1% of Americans who actually uh, grew up on a farm. It was an apple orchard in Ohio. And uh, I will say one of the things I discovered very early is that farming is hard work. So uh, this is why I'm no longer on the farm in, uh, in Ohio. But I think this point about technology transforming farming, the drones and the tractors and the uh, satellite photos and all of the, and, and the monitors, all the things you can do to improve the efficiency and the um, ease or the, uh, of, of farming has got to be a, a big improvement not just uh, in the developed world, but potentially everywhere. I think I mentioned uh, in our conversation, we were talking about what, uh, what jobs would look like in the future. And I said, well, my grandfather wouldn't recognize what I do as work. <laughs> and I think we would not recognize what our grandchildren do as work. I want to turn the, the table to uh, manufacturing. And in, there's no better place to start than Intel. Uh, how much have you automated your factories? Are there the last few humans left who are going to get automated out? What's, uh, where are we in, in that progression of um, productivity? So as I answer that question, I want to say I'm, I'm uh, suddenly aware that the most knowledgeable person about that subject just walked in, <laughs> Stu, Stu Pan, from, originally from Intel, now at Hewlett Packard. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to meet tomorrow. Hope you'll be there. <laughs> Okay, um, so he will correct me, I hope, if I'm, if I'm wrong. Uh, the majority of our employees are still people who actually uh, get involved in the process of uh, manufacturing. And they, I think that the fabrication, the fabs and the other plants actually do have a lot of employees. But I don't think there's much doubt that in that industry, as in most other manufacturing industries, the number of workers you need, you can put it in dollar terms or in unit terms, must be way down. And, and Stu can probably verify that, yeah. Do we still need a pair of hands? And talk a little bit about what a pair of hands means now. We, you know, it's interesting. Um, the, there, are two, there are two sides to what people are worried about. You know, one is they're worried about the, lo the loss of the growth potential or mm -hmm. the loss of actual growth. The other is there are people who are clearly worried that the um, machines are going to take over, that we're reaching some point of singularity and they're going to get smarter than us really fast and we're going to be kind of uh, not sure where our place in the world is. And, and people, I suppose some of them hold this fear simultaneously that there'll be no more progression in technology or there will be progression in technology. And we're, we're in trouble either way. And, we're, and, they're, and they're pretty sure we're in trouble either, either way. It's a little hard to answer their, their concerns because they're coming on both sides of the subject. But, um, I'm, in, I'm impressed with the things I've, I've read in the literature about, for example, how um, Gary Gosperoff um, reacted when he lost, I guess, to Deep Blue. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, no, mas uh, no chess master will ever be able to be the best computer again. So he got interested in advanced chess uh, or freeform chess. And, and politics. He's actually and politics. migrated more there, which <laughs> but computers he, are useless. But he has people and computers competing against people and computers. Mm. And the winner is always not a group of, uh, not the world's best machine, and not a group of people who are chess masters, but a, a group of people who have a good understanding of chess, a fantastic understanding of computers, and know how to use the computer to beat the other teams. And people have suggested, Bryn Yolfson has suggested, for example, that may be a model of where we go in the future, that we learn to use the machines to greatly enhance our productivity, um, and that we get this growth explosion, which we're all hoping for. At the same time, we get the computers getting, and the robots and so on, getting more and more useful. Mm -hmm. um, I think there, there could be some truth to, there, that could be an accurate view of where we might be going. It's encouraging. I will also say it's somewhat exhausting. You don't necessarily ever get to rest and say, okay, I've learned all I want to learn about computer languages, or I've learned all I want to learn about data 
uh, analytics, I'm, I'm done. Well, if you say you're done, you might actually be done at that point. So it could be exhausting, but, I, but you know, growth can be exhausting, and it still has its own rewards. I mean, I'm done. You can download me now. <laughs> <laughs> Hal, take it away. What are, what are your thoughts on something? Well, I, it was interesting. I went to the uh, artificial intelligence uh, meeting a couple years ago, and you're absolutely right. They've retired chess. It's no longer interesting. But now what they're trying to do is see if computers could beat humans at poker. <clears throat> you know, do they have an advantage in problem, bluffing? Which yeah, is kind it's, of it's a somewhat harder problem, yeah, in, in several dimensions. So, but, uh, but that's the challenge they're, uh, they're working on. Uh, now and I think that uh, well, we'll see we'll see computers playing that role as well. Um, it's a I wanted to ask Paul a question about one of the Intel practices copy exactly, yeah, which is fascinating as I understand it. The uh, when you ever build a new plant, the productivity is significantly lower than the old plants, and then the policy was acted to try to copy the old plants, the the previous uh, plants exactly. And my concern about that is I'm sure it increases productivity, but isn't there some benefit in having uh, some mutations or randomization or potential learning that can occur from, from uh, having uh, genetic diversity in your production methods? So I'm a, my impression from hearing our people talk about the problems in the fabs and the way they solve them is there's problem solving going on all the time. Best practices are always evolving. The, I think the main advantage of copy exactly is we've watched other firms uh, try to do something pretty hard and go through a very, very long and painful period of trying to get uh, good yields out of their methods. And if we know how to do something already, we want to start by doing it that way. But I don't think that we're against the idea of, of, of innovation. Now, I, I, it's clearly possible to take copy exactly to an extreme. All you have to do is visit any Intel facility and realize it looks like every other Intel facility um, to know that we can, we can apply it in the wrong places. But it does seem to uh, save what can be a disastrous start in, in, when you open a new fabrication plant. Yana, you've actually done research in semiconductors. Uh, take me through your thoughts on how far toward uh, ultimate productivity we are in high-tech manufacturing and maybe even in low-tech manufacturing too. Or is that getting close to a solved problem? Is there a lot more to be accomplished in uh, making the factory work better? Well, um, absolutely, we are not even close to the frontier. That's one of the exciting things about the tech. I'm not a semiconductor expert. I mean, clearly, given who I'm seated, seated here with, um, I, I wouldn't claim that. But I think from everything I hear and see in, in our research, it's very clear that the technological pipeline is as strong as it has, as it has ever been not just in, in the pure, if you want, in, a, in one strand of technology, but the, just the depth and the capacity for us to cross different kinds of technologies is just at the completely new level. So in that sense, even though I said I was somewhere in the, in the middle of the optimism, it surely is not because we think technology has run out of steam. I think it's very clear that that pipeline is very strong. The challenge is more is that will we have the institutions, will we have the changes in policies that uh, enabled the last 50 years to really be a truly exceptional period of growth. We saw a lot of reforms of the policies. We saw a lot of government investment on new R&D, whether it was because of Department of Defense or energy, energy reasons. I think it is the environment around it that really is, in my view, the one that constrains the capacity of the technology to really make a big difference. So when you say environment around it, I start to think of sustainability issues. What's the pollution overload? Uh, what are some of the congestion issues that come in China is sort of a laboratory for what happens with pell-mell growth. Uh, do these problems get better? Do they get worse? If they get better, what's the new factor that's going to save the planet? Hmm. Easy ones you, you, you throw this evening. Well, I'm just getting started. Gonna, exactly. You know, exactly. It's getting from from there. That sounds great. I actually work a lot with cities, and it's, I think the, the one reason that makes me optimistic about the city situation in some of the Chinese cities, that you look at many of the cities that we had 50 or 100 years ago, London in the 1950s, you, you may have read on the history books about the smoke at the time, and it was really... Well, they had the cholera a century or two before. London's always been on the brink of collapse. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But now they are probably, if you have to pick one city that's on a roll, that would be London. So, and I think it is, uh, I am actually optimistic that we are able to address many of those, uh, many of those challenges. I think there will be changes because of uh, 
there will be changes, I hope, in the way we, for example, measure economic performance. So there's going to be some ways of accounting some of those environmental factors so that we won't be so focused on just GDP. I think that's something that economists can actually contribute to make a difference. But I'm an economist for training, so you won't expect me to say anything else, I assume. <laughs> but that's potentially a political change where there, there are ways that uh, people with non-economic interests get to sit at the table to have the discussion. And that's probably, I'm, I'm going to guess that depends on each country's own evolving political system. Yeah. I, I think some of these problems start to create their own solution. Okay. And so when you end up having people who have some privileges, they've done well economically in whatever system they're in, and they think the air is unbearably polluted, you start to get some pushback. I think the question for, for China will be whether their system can possibly be responsive enough, given the determination of the party to keep everything a, 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 as a one-party state, whether they can be responsive enough. But in places, in other places where we had various kinds of, of horrible air pollution incidents and where we had poison, mercury, and other, other incidents, the political reaction ended up making a difference. Um, Economists might prefer that there be a kind of pricing or a tax system uh, to tax away some of the bad behavior or to give people the right incentives. That's gotten harder with the political uh, view that no taxes are acceptable. That, uh, but that used to be part of our toolkit, and I, I would look forward to people sort of trying that out again to solve some of the, some of the problems. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what within Google's brain trust are you seeing that, that gives you optimism on sustainability? What well, are some of the things I, you like? Let, let me talk about a topic near and dear to our hearts, which is related to sustainability, and that's congestion. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, we, we all encounter that. Look at uh, Google. Google has large offices in Silicon Valley, San Francisco, New York, and London. All of those places have extremely high housing prices, and they're not going to get any better because essentially uh, they're pretty built up. Uh, the infrastructure is built to support a certain amount of, uh, of uh, traffic, and uh, it's only going to get worse. I happen to look up the elasticity of demand uh, of traffic to the price of gasoline. And the basic uh, rule is if the price of gasoline falls by 50 percent, the uh, traffic goes up by 5 percent in the first year, and about 15 percent after three years have passed. We can't take 15% more traffic in the Bay Area. It's ridiculous. So we have to learn to address uh, this problem of a better transportation system and a uh, uh, more distributed uh, environment. And I think that's true of both of the other uh, places I mentioned, too. Uh, we aren't going to get more housing, in my view, because of NIMBY that everybody thinks there should be more housing until they buy their house, at which point they don't want any more housing density. Uh, and so in some ways, it's the market system at work. We're seeing these rents increasing because we have increased demand and a fixed supply. But uh, how, do we, how do we really address that in a market economy, not just a controlled economy that you were describing in China, but a market economy here uh, in, uh, in those uh, cities I mentioned? So I moved to New York right after college and had my first introduction to unaffordable housing. <laughs> and I've come to think that a lot of economic growth ties to unaffordable housing, that the more housing costs, the more furiously people have to innovate. Uh, you do real economics. I just make conversation. But and should, we, should we take a second look at the, uh, the housing equation and, and wonder whether higher housing prices are necessarily as bad as some people think? Well, I mean, the worst thing about the Bay Area is our public transportation is so bad. In fact, mm -hmm. our whole transportation infrastructure is bad mm -hmm. compared to New York or London, for sure. And uh, you know, how do we uh, how do we confront that? And uh, there's a lot of uh, there, I think there's still a huge amount of growth potential in 650, mm -hmm. but we have to face this problem of how do we create infrastructure, housing, services that are really support that growth. Yana, what are some of the most interesting things you've seen that would help congestion and that would give us a transportation system that's not just 2% better than what we have today, but factor of two, factor of five better? The simple answer is more dense living. 
And I think modernist living makes it much easier for people to walk, make, makes public transportation much better. And I think we actually, as luck would have it, at the end of the last year, we just published a big report on affordable housing. And I mean a big report. So there's lots of case studies, et cetera. And I think we actually were, we came out quite optimistic. There is much more <coughs> land in most cities that are very expensive today that if you actually studied finding out, for example, unused government land, unused uh, lots, et cetera, there is a lot you can do on affordable housing um, in, with very market-based tools, et cetera. So in that sense, here again, it's unfortunately a, a political constraint. I don't think it's an economic constraint because this is not a, a you don't buy and sell market, uh, land on the market in a similar way as you would some, some, some products. But it, there definitely are solutions, and my colleagues are actually going around talking about that a lot. However, another thing that I think is really important is that while we tend to think of the cities that have been built, cities are one of the longest assets in the world. They stand tall when countries fall and, and, and rise around them. But we actually are seeing most of the growth in cities in the emerging markets happening right now. So the assets that we'll see in 15, 20 years, a very large share of them is just to be built. And it's actually those cities that will greatly matter for sustainability, making sure that those cities are built with good structures, good infrastructure, dense living. That would be the biggest factor mm -hmm. for global economic sustainability. So I want to take that insight and put it out to the audience. How many people here live in detached homes? OK, um, about 40%. How many people live in apartments? Okay, of the people in apartments, how many have moved out of a detached home to go into an apartment in the last five years? Last 10 years? Okay, uh, and I, I, to be systematic, I need to do it the other way. How many people have moved out of apartments into detached homes? Okay, so there's migration both ways. Uh, I, I'm wrestling with how thought that people will not tolerate more dense housing. Uh, it seems like Yana was trying to tug me in the other direction, and it's a complicated issue, but I think there, there may be stages in life where coming closer together brings benefits in terms of greater access to interesting services uh, on the so, urban experience. So, so my point was not that they wouldn't tolerate uh, more dense housing. I think the people who have that housing will like it, but it's a case of uh, pulling up the ladder. So once you've got your ideal place to live, then you don't want more density anymore. Mm -hmm. and that's really a political problem. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a democratic uh, system at work. Uh, but I think we see it in operation all the time. There's hardly been any new housing units constructed in San Francisco in 10 years. There's been a huge increase in demand. And every time somebody files a uh, plan for more dense housing, it's essentially shot down. Okay. So mm -hmm. that's the problem. The problem is, Yes, you absolutely could house many more people, but how do you make that politically palatable? Mm -hmm. Paul, you were an airline economist in the past life. Um, give me your thoughts on the transportation problem. This is interesting. Uh, yeah. Um, so let me say something maybe somewhat controversial. I think when it comes to airline transportation, there isn't that transportation problem. It's a highly contestable industry in which companies can come in and compete against other companies pretty quickly because the factory is the airplane and the laborers are flying in. Mm -hmm. uh, it's generally, unless there are laws prohibiting it, pretty easy to exit the industry. Uh, but it, that also explains why it's an industry which is always on the verge of collapse because it's, it's hard to make sustained profits unless you are a flag carrier for a nation that uses its political uh, rights to make sure you don't face much competition. The consolidation that's happened that's been a, quite a lot in the last 20 years has may change some of that uh, give, and give air, make us face somewhat higher prices, holding the price of oil constant. Um, but I would actually argue as a people mover, the domestic airline system and to some extent the international system over both of the oceans works pretty well. Um, that's why um, you know, I'm not enthusiastic about the bullet train idea from Southern California to Northern California on the view that we already have a mass transit system that works pretty well, and that's called Southwest Airlines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it moves people around pretty quickly and does it more cheaply than a lot of tr train transportation has had to price itself in the Northeast to, to make things work. 
Well, and you have the devil's trade-off of in order to get high ridership, you need to give people stops close to their natural arrival and departure place. And the more stops you put in, the slower it becomes. And there's, there's no good equilibrium in there. I said that I probably am, have a very common experience as, as, an, as an, econom an American economist. I have trouble justifying public uh, subsidies or creation of a train system. And yet, when I'm in Europe, I love the trains. Right. The, uh, I, uh, Paul and I were talking uh, earlier, uh, and, and my plan is to replace the, uh, the high-speed train plan with a uh, extra lane on Interstate 5 that says autonomous vehicles only. And then <laughs> <laughs> what happens is you have a self-assembling train. And if it's only autonomous vehicles on the road, no problem with going 140, 150 miles an hour, and uh, the whole uh, trip problem just disappears, and it's only the cost of that one extra lane. So presumably they can draft off each other, sure, too. Of so course. the first one, yeah, you know, it's like, it's, it's it's like the Tour de France. <laughs> <laughs> I, Without the Who's going to be the Lance Without Armstrong? The drugs. Of our <laughs> how are you going to deal with it? Who's going to be the Lance Armstrong of the Tour de France, <laughs> and how are you going to handle that one? Well, it's a, it, to me it makes, a, makes much more sense because you can, uh, you can, it can be cheaper, it can be faster, it can be more flexible. The whole, the whole model just changes if you That's actually very that. appealing. Yeah. And I actually hope that will happen so we get the cost of some of these public transport systems very quickly down and we can push them out in the emerging markets. Yeah. Because that really is where the infrastructure is lacking today and we would need exactly those, those the, trains. I mean, the biggest problem for the driverless car is not, not other autonomous vehicles. They're nice and predictable. It's those crazy humans that you have to worry <laughs> about. And so if you had a lane of your own, uh, you don't need, I mean, that could easily be done today in terms of the, uh, the, the technolo level of technology. Nice, nice. I want to come back to healthcare for a bit. I wrote about healthcare in the 90s when I was at the Wall Street Journal and it was 13% of US GDP then. And there were no end of reports that began by declaring that 13% was intolerable. And I think we're up to about 17% now. Uh, what is our objective in healthcare? What are we trying to measure? I mean, it, it seems to me that we have conflicted priorities where we all want to live forever. We want to you know, overcome what was debilitating to previous generations, and then we don't want it to cost very much. What's, uh, offer your sense of where we should be headed on healthcare. What are the metrics that matter? What are the ones that don't? Donna, you get to take the first shot at it. Yeah, um, it's, it's very, very true. Globally, healthcare expenditures are projected to grow 2% faster than GDP. So in a way, that's clearly unsustainable in the, in the long run. Measuring healthcare outcomes and, and productivity is a real challenge. And from our perspective, the, the way we actually measure it, that we look at the cost savings that are available given equal or better health outcomes. And fortunately, as in many cases in lean, lean operations, whether you're talking about cars or other things, you can actually get lower cost and better, uh, better service at the same time. And I think on the challenge really, as I'm sure everybody's aware, is that the incentive structure in the healthcare, healthcare system is such that there is really oftentimes the decision maker doesn't really see the cost. So a colleague of mine, for example, was talking about her mother who was thinking about a major operation, extremely multiple hundreds of thousands of cost, very likely op operation that she felt very uneven about. She didn't know whether she should actually take that, make that or not because of the risks involved. And the point of my colleague was to say, how about if we gave the choice to her instead of saying, do you want to take the operation or not? How about if we instead ask her, do you want to put four or five of your grandkids through college, or do you want to have this operation? I don't think it would take her five minutes to make that choice. So in many ways, it is the incentive structure that's a, a real challenge. And I think that means that because of the fact that it's, in, if, if, unless we see a change in the political and, and management in, environment, it really needs to come from management metrics. We need to increase transparency, transparency. We need to increase information so that people are better informed. And this is one of the areas where I would love to see the Silicon Valley uh, region and the companies and folks here perhaps be innovating in how can we increase transparency? How can we bring some more of the sunlight into the corners of the cobwebs of what is happening? And that would allow people to actually individually make better informed choices. It would also put light on things where things are not working as well. And I don't know where and how, but I would love to hear brilliant ideas because it's unlikely that we'll see dramatic shift in the, in the, in the structure of the industry. Mm -hmm. I think the problem is a lot of Silicon Valley companies have looked at health informatics and so yeah. on. And of course, it seems like a very, very attractive uh, 
uh, business opportunity, but then when you actually start dealing with this regulatory thicket that surrounds this area, uh, it soon looks much less, much less attractive. So to me, if they were able to clean up the regular, regulatory environment, make compliance easier, you'd probably see a lot more innovation there. Paul? Yeah, I agree. One of the things I've gotten to do uh, through some of the gatherings that are, of economists that, that occur spontaneously mm -hmm. is to hear people from the UC San Diego Medical School talk about what they're doing as entrepreneurs, and uh, sometimes as private entrepreneurs, sometimes as part of their, their faculty and teaching job. And what you'll hear constantly is they're getting incredibly good results but the regulatory mechanism to get approval to use them for not for research but for therapy is very long and uncertain and measured in years and in fact they've gotten pretty good at being at, at, at learning how to declare therapy research so that they don't have patients that they feel they can save actually die while waiting for regulatory approval f for a new kind of treatment so again i think we've 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 become pretty cautious as a very wealthy country. And, um, and it's almost unbearable to think of someone dying from malpractice. But as people have long pointed out, if you want to have zero malpractice, you might get zero practice. Uh, it just becomes very scary, expensive, and everyone is suspicious of every move that's taken. So I, th I think there are some, there probably are going to be a lot of medical breakthroughs. I do think we have to examine the system if you set out to devise a system that would deprive all of the decision makers of information about what anything costs, you would come up with the current system. Mm -hmm. Just try it. Ask your physician when he or she recommends a treatment what it's going to cost, and you will see the look of a deer in headlights. Okay? They have an office manager, so they don't have to think about that problem. Well, the sister issue is we pay physicians and hospitals by and large, for doing a lot. I mean, some of the DRG capitation mechanisms drive hospitals a little differently, but certainly on the doctor side, to come up with the right intervention and then send the patient away um, gives you much less money than coming up with a lot of halfway steps. So we tend to overtreat and we tend to prolong care. Yeah, we've all probably seen this either with ourselves or with loved ones. When you get onto a certain health track, the medical system is ready, especially if you have good insurance, to prescribe very expensive procedures. Mm -hmm. and not, create, not telling you what the trade-offs are, mm -hmm. uh, not worrying because they have someone, and, and I don't want to blame MDs or any other group for this. Let me just say that allocation systems can work pretty well if people know what the prices are. And in US medicine, I used to think there was no price. Now I think there are millions of prices or thousands <laughs> of prices. You can't get a straight answer to the question of what a hip replacement costs. There, there, was, there was a paper uh, in the, um, uh, one of the medical journals, but the, the Journal of American Medical Association online, one of their online journals, about the answer to that question for an uncomplicated hip replacement uh, for a, a fictional patient who would be, was in her 60s, was in generally good health, had enough money to pay for what, what she needed. The, the answer ranged between $10,000 and $120,000 as the researchers were sort of asking people. And we've seen that repeated. It's quite other astonishing. Stories. There's no other sector where you'd see that level That's of right. disparity. That's right. yeah. So too many prices as opposed to no prices. And by the way, just to be, for the record, I think that in the industry, they are starting to use data and they are trying to see some of that barrier. So in a way, I was talking more about the transparency side, which I think would be really good from everybody's perspective. I think the, the industry is really going after because they realize how much they may be overpaying. Mm -hmm. uh, Yana, you get to see a more global perspective on these issues. China and India are in a position now to build out their healthcare systems for what will soon be quite advanced economies. Do you like the steps they're taking? Um, are they going to avoid making the kinds of missteps that the U.S. did, or are they going to walk into the same problems that we have? Well, um, I actually i am not an expert on healthcare, and particularly on the policy issues that are happening there right now, but I think of of uh, some things that I think it's clear that they do study the mistakes that others have done. So I'm, ho I'm hopeful that there will be innovations and I think the kinds of, the kinds of uh, services that they offer and the kinds of um, demand they get from their customers will be different. However, it's unclear. I think it is, particularly in the case of, I think China is going to be a big factor in a way. How, how are they going to take care of their health care? It's not, it, it's not a big priority in the, when you look at the government's plan. It may be an industry that will 
grow slower there, for example, mm -hmm. overall, and it will be more limited to a certain segment. I mean, there, there, one doesn't know. I think it's something um, to watch. Sure. Mm -hmm. and, and China really has this demographic time bomb from it the one-child policy, so the issue is going to get much worse as time goes on. That's a good point. Yeah, they're going to have a large elderly population and not that many workers to support it. Uh, let's spend a few minutes on education. If we're going to think about how you grow the world economy over the next 30 years, how you drive productivity, I always thought human capital is as much of an engine as anything. Uh, Hal, why don't you talk a little bit about Google's perspective on education, what you're able to do either directly or indirectly as a company, and then any thoughts of whether we're, you know, the education curve's accelerating or decelerating. Well, let me go back to my uh, uh, high IQ person behind the plow in Africa, mm. India, China, wherever. Uh, the, the resource which is the most important to them, I think, is something like Khan Academy that really starts at the very basics and builds up and builds up and builds up. One of the problems in schools, especially with mathematics education, is if you miss a week of class or the kid is sick or they don't understand some concept, they're lost because mathematics is so cumulative in nature. And with the Khan Academy, you can go back and review that lesson and see what you missed and understand it and then join the, the rest of the group. So having that ability to replay the teacher's lessons is simple. I mean, it's not such a great, profound technological <clears throat> idea, but I think it's, it's extremely powerful. And if you look at the Khan Academy now, it's available in many languages, uh, both via Google Translate and via volunteers, uh, speakers of the language. So you can export that kind of instruction to the entire world. So I actually think a lot of the um, potential productivity gains in education can come from relatively simple applications of technology. Relatively simple because it's just allowing for this uh, le learn on demand or learn, learn when, uh, when you can, not necessarily during school hours. You also redefine class size, that you no longer have an upper limit of 30 or 40 kids beyond which yeah. the classroom doesn't function. You can go to 30,000 or 400,000. Paul? Well, the, an interesting question is whether or not there has been a failure of public education in the U.S. And I'm going to take the notion from what I think I've observed and read that probably there has been, that it's been going on since a, maybe around 1980, maybe a little earlier. There are figures about how many uh, years and months of education the average person has in, in, in different countries around the world. And the U.S. used to be way out in front. It no longer is, and you could argue that maybe we were spending, having people spend too much time in school. There are certainly people who suggest that. But other countries have passed the U.S. now in the average number of, of, of years, so they haven't found that there's too much. Uh, we, we certainly have common worries that our, our kids, and some of those people would be adults at this point, are not adequately trained. Mm -hmm. um, so there might be a problem, and it's in the list of, of um, Professor Gordon's things about why we're not going to get the high growth going forward that we've neglected education and we have to pay, and we must pay a price for that, uh, would, would be the argument. I like what, what Hal's saying because it suggests that you can have a lot more education than what occurs in the classroom and also the classroom could, could, could do better. Um, but education is not a joy for everyone. You know, probably almost everyone in this room really highly values and has enjoyed a lot of their education or they probably wouldn't come to an event like this. But for a lot of people, including people who lose jobs because of, um, it could be because of trade dislocation, when you say we'll retrain you, uh, they basically have sometimes given the answer, I didn't like school the first time. Why do you think I'd want to go back to school to be retrained? That's not going to work. So we, we talk about the ideal of lifetime learning. And again, I suspect everyone in this in this room is going to be able to pull that off to some extent. But it's not necessarily something that we figured out how to teach everyone else. Let, let me uh, throw in another uh, very important phenomenon that I think is underrated, and that's the uh, uh, YouTube as an educational channel. It's not just funny who, cat who tricks. Who owns that? I remind no, me. No, let me, <laughs> let, let, me, let, let me give you the example. <laughs> It's not just the funny cats, and it's not just music. There are fantastic how-tos. I mean, how to do this, how to do that, and not necessarily 
technical or what we think of as higher education, but how to install a furnace or how to fix this or how to uh, adjust that. And, and how it's to amazing. Prune vineyards. How to, how to yeah. grow vineyards. So it's amazing the resources that are accessible yeah. now in, the, in this kind of learning. And this kind of learning, I think, is very, very important. And people, when they see that, that knowing how to fix a furnace is important to their job and important to their paycheck, they're going to learn how to do it. So there isn't any resistance to this. It's having the resources readily available at low cost at your convenience that really makes a huge difference. So just to be quarrelsome, um, I, I, I waste as much time on YouTube as anyone. Uh, I am alarmed to see how many organizations now want me to watch the video instead of providing text. Uh, doing my taxes, TurboTax now has some person in a bow tie who wants to explain the tax code to me. I don't need to see the guy in the bow tie. I just need to know do I put the number in column one or column three. But I have to go through three minutes of the guy in the bow tie to do this. Uh, in my darkest moments, I worry that mass literacy is about a five-century detour in human evolution <laughs> and that no one knew how to read and write in 1400 and come 2100, no one's going to know how to read and write because <laughs> they're all going to be on YouTube. Um, can you protect literacy or is that the trade-off that I have to make, that we're, we're now going to move into a very visual, chatty world where the art of writing and telling stories and imparting knowledge right. disappears. So, so I hear you and I sympathize with that view myself okay. because I like to read. Uh, for me, reading through the instruction manual is usually better than uh, watching the long video. What instruction but, manual? Yeah, right. For some <laughs> tasks, for some tasks, uh, cooking or something that, or, or gardening or how to create a bonsai tree or something like that, the video instruction is better. And there are some people that like the video instruction. And even if there isn't a manual uh, in a lot of these things, at least there's often a PDF file. So you can, uh, you can go for the text, you can go for the video. It's whatever your style is. Fair enough. Can I add my two cents to Please. the education thing? Yes. Because uh, actually, when we look back at the last 50 years, it really was the fact that it was the large baby boomer generation that got a lot of ed education investment on them that has fueled a lot of the growth in the Western world. When we think of the global growth going forward, perhaps one of the, I, I did say that the cities are going to be a critical factor how those cities are built. I think perhaps as high, if not even more important, is the education given to the large cohorts in many of the emerging markets. This is extremely critical in Latin America, for example, where they are already starting to age, and the big cohorts are right now at the schooling age. They are almost losing the train, if you want, unless they can really lift broad-based education amongst the labor force of risky of becoming old before they become rich. And I think that's a real concern in thinking about what would be the next cohorts that would come through and that through higher education. And, and with that typically comes higher productivity in one way or another because the people learn to make more of whatever resources they have. I think places to watch are India and then Africa. If we really were going to get the education of these large cohorts as they go through the demographic transition of declining fertility and aging, that would make a huge difference for global growth. And I think that's where so to build on your thought, one of the things that concerns me, and now I'm getting a little more serious than my anti-video rant, uh, education tends to be accretive in terms of how we build schools. We teach everything that we taught in the 1800s, and then we layer on some stuff that we do in the 1900s. I think elementary schools have just now decided that maybe spending a year teaching cursive writing is not the most important thing. Uh, in fact, let, let's do a survey. How many people uh, still write in cursive fairly regularly? Okay. How many people have essentially abandoned cursive writing? Yeah, count me in. Uh, I, it's pretty. I sometimes wish I could make the nice loops and everything. But in terms of how we get our ideas across, keyboarding is far and away the most prominent. Uh, I'm going to guess within 20 years, swiping is second. And uh, block printing is third. And then cursive writing is a little bit like riding a horse. It's lovely if you feel like doing it, but it's not the main <laughs> way of, <laughs> of getting around. Uh, in, in mathematics, I now see high schools still want the kids to take calculus, and then if they've aced calculus junior year, they can go take statistics. I don't know about everyone else in the room, but for me, I use statistics multiple times a week. It's been a long time since I've tried to take an integral, and granted, I'm far away from that field, but I'm seeing from heads nodding. Uh, stats is just vastly more relevant, but for a world where people 
designed bridges and calculated um, missile trajectories by hand, you needed calculus. Now you can input it somewhere, um, but you need to have some sense of, is the data solid? What do we know from the data? And yet we haven't been able to take calc out of the rotation and move statistics in a little closer. So I, I would be concerned that it's not just the number of years in school, but are we <coughs> making the best possible use, or are we forcing people to retrace all of human development? I think, George, you are arguing against yourself. On one hand, you say we shouldn't be watching videos, and on the other hand, you say we shouldn't do calculus. I think, I mean, as somebody who did enjoy or write, math. Or write. Oh, right, exactly. <laughs> on the, so in many ways, it you is. You want a more efficient way to write. I mean, I'm not anti-writing. I just want to be able to get my words out quickly. Yeah, but I think it is. It is Frankly, as somebody who, I grew up in Finland, went through the Finnish schooling system. My husband is from Mexico, went through a Catholic schooling system there, and my kids uh, are going through in California. And in many parts, I can just see that the things that we got drilled in are very, very different. And you may think that all of that drilling was useless. Um, we wrote in very nice cursive in Finland, by the way. But I actually, I think it's all like mental... Uh, calisthenics, if you want. It's exercise. It is just learning the kids. It doesn't really matter what you learn. We never learned the American precedents. We've learned very different things. So in, in many ways, I'm not so sure all of that is useless, just because it uses, builds your brain muscle in some way. Of course, I know nothing what I talk about on no, this field. Okay, but. no, I, I, I take your point that sometimes mental drills for their own yeah. sake, in the, in the same way that sit-ups and push-ups make you a better exactly. athlete, even if the sport exactly. doesn't involve sit-ups well, and push -ups. And of course, if you want to be successful in the civil service, you have to know Latin and Greek, or at least that was true 200 <laughs> years ago. So it is a kind of mental calisthenics, and I believe that's, uh, that's an excellent point, but it's probably more efficient to try to do those calisthenics on something that's actually building up the muscles you're going to use yeah. later on than to do it on something that's not going to be touched uh, at all. I agree. It can be done better, the calisthenics. Okay. So part of being a good moderator is knowing when to step into the background and give everyone here a chance to ask the questions. We have about half an hour for Q&A. We have people with microphones who will be able to come and uh, give everyone who wants to uh, a chance to ask a question. So let's move to Q&A, and I'll be looking for the first question. Okay, we've got one right here, I think, uh, just to your left. Yeah, so first of all, it was, a, it was a fabulous discussion, and I, I really picked up on what you said, and I've agreed that I think probably the, the next Einstein has probably been born and died in sub-Saharan Africa or China. So now that you have this opportunity, and there's a, a, a kid somewhere in China that has access to the internet and can essentially educate himself, he can, he can go to YouTube and educate himself, how does that person then get into uh, the world where he can be a productive part of it, where he can use those skills? I mean, if you're interviewing people for positions at Google or where I work, or else, they still have to have a high school education and a diploma and then a college diploma and hopefully a master's or something. But So now that this technology exists for these people to bring themselves up to this level of education and maybe through a completely different pathway without all the rote learning and everything else, how do they then get into the system where they're productive? Well, I, I guess I'm optimistic on that point because I think that people can recognize talent uh, when they, and merit when they see it, and, and this is uh, particularly true in China where they're constantly on the lookout for athletes and for mathematical talent, chess playing talent, all of these things. So, so I don't see that as a problem. I do see it as a problem if there's no infrastructure at all for uh, this child to, to develop. But I think, uh, you know, we were talking earlier about cities. I mean, one of the great things about cities is you can have this confluence of talent. There's a lot of density there, and people can be recognized. Uh, their abilities can be recognized perhaps much better than they would be in some uh, distant village. So the urbification is going to contribute to this, uh, helping to solve this problem that you described. It's a real problem, but uh, there are some things that can and help alleviate it. I wanted to say that the, the tragedy is the next Einstein might be a little girl somewhere yes. in a country that won't allow education. Mm -hmm. That's actually uh, a really uh, big issue. It, it, yeah. That's so true. I mean, you know, Larry Summers has said the biggest investment you can make is educating women. Right. 
and uh, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a huge problem around the world, I think. Next question. Yeah, regarding uh, the macro subject that's on the program, I'm curious to know what your re reasons for the fact that productivity growth has been slowing and, and investment has been slowing uh, since this sort of peak in the debt super cycle that I know McKinsey's written a lot about in 2008. Um, so on a macro level, why is, why is there less business investment? Why is it slowing and why is productivity slowing in the industrialized world? So let me, let me raise uh, one phenomenon that I think is quite important, and that has to do with the first uh, invasion of the robots. So when did the robots first invade? Well, I claim it was around 1880, 1890, and we now call these robots washing machines, dryers, vacuum cleaners, dishwashers, lawnmowers, etc. And where did they show up? They showed up in domestic production. And where do they show up in GDP? They weren't in GDP, right? Because it's not a monetized sector. There's not a market system going on within the household. The household productivity increased dramatically, freed up a lot of women to enter the labor force, and we saw a much higher income per household because of that invasion of those robots that impacted domestic productivity. So what happens now with all of these tools that we feel must be productivity enhancing, where are they in GDP? Well, my claim is they're all in transactions costs, or maybe not all of them, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but many of them are in transactions costs. You may remember when we had these things called maps and you would draw these lines on the maps and try to figure out how to get from A to B and you would get lost and drive around, all these things. That's gone. So there's huge savings of time and effort because we've gotten rid of that tedious, unpleasant activity, much like washing dishes and other forms of housework. Uh, so if we look at uh, many kinds of activity, Google is a great example. We did a study with Google where we took a 1,000 questions, gave them to teams of students, starting in the lobby of the library, and said, go answer these questions. And we gave the same questions to another team of students and said, answer them using Google. Took 22 minutes per question using the library. Took uh, seven minutes per question using Google. 15 minutes per question, time saved. And all of us are benefiting from that productivity increase. It's just not measured in dollar terms in our economy. So. I think productivity has increased. It's primarily a measurement issue that, that prevents us from recognizing it. All that time savings hasn't shown up in increased production? So, so just as with the uh, increased time savings in domestic work enabling women to enter the labor force, it takes some time for this, for this to happen. So we are using our time uh, more efficiently, or can be. Some of that is then going into angry birds and, uh, and other distractions, but people like it. It's, it's beneficial. You know, we used to stare off into space at the, at the uh, bus stop uh, thinking profound thoughts about man's place in the universe, and now we play Angry Birds. So <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, the question is, as we are able to uh, harness those time savings and apply them in uh, productive labor, I think we will see uh, this this productivity enhancement occur. Can, uh, can no, no, actually, let me give you Anna a chance because it's your report. Uh, what, what do you see as the factors that bring a slowdown? Is it a measurement issue yeah. or there's, um, is it deeper? First of all, I think if you had to pick one thing that economists know the least about and can predict the, the least, it would be productivity. Alan Plyder famously said that any swings in the productivity rates just a few months ago, he said, any swings that we have seen in the past have been a surprise for the economists. And I don't think this swing is different. So you'll probably have six answers, given that you have three, 200 economists on, on what we actually would think as the explanation. The debate is very much raging. For, and I think given that we are seeing demographics decline, we basically are going to see not just a decline on growth, but we are going to see peak employment. It will be all about productivity. So that's why 
we need to find a way to have a better handle. For me, personally, thinking about what the slowdown has been in the last few years, this is really about the animal spirits of investors. It's not that we don't have the money in many of the companies. It is the fact that people are worried that there aren't the customers, there aren't the people who actually will spend the money they have to purchase these goods and, goods and services. And at the same time, they might be afraid that it will be, the, the profits won't be there if it's, for example, an, an industry where the margins are getting thinner and thinner. So in many ways, it is a vicious circle at this moment, which doesn't mean it can't change when expectations change, etc. We can see investment, we can see change. We see that happen, I mean, swings in productivity happen much more often than we would actually expect. We see some industries have see big changes. So I don't think there is a, perfect answer, and, but this is my read of the, of the recent past. So, so one of the areas where uh, that's very important to the productivity stats is computers and chips, where measurement issues are extremely difficult. You know, we use this hedonic adjustment where uh, if you can get a chip that's twice as fast at the same price, then we've got higher productivity. I think one of the interesting uh, phenomena in that industry, and I really would like to hear your opinion on this, is that the goals in chip manufacture have changed somewhat. There's been a lot of effort put into low energy consumption, enhanced battery life for mobile devices, multi-core chips for data centers. Okay. So just adding more MIPS uh, is not as valuable from an economic perspective as having longer battery life, longer useful life, and, uh, and multi-core processing for data center applications. Yeah, there's actually a, a good example. If you use it, look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics calculations about how much the quality of central processing unit chips have increased, you would see a very robust growth rate inferred every single year until around 2005. And then you see almost a complete stall. So the BLS would tell you that based on their measurements, there's been no improvement in CPUs for 10 years. Now, during that time, you've you've all benefited from every time a new generation of CPUs came out, you had a more powerful PC or other devices that you could be using. Um, and that is accidentally not being priced correctly by BLS. Uh, I've seen other examples of this in the airline industry. Um, I saw at a time when the airlines were watching the fares they could get plummet. It was not too long after 9-11. The the BLS reported, and it was picked up by the, by the newspapers and the magazines, that airline prices were holding up really nicely. They were using what was a, a full, what called a full wife fare that no one ever paid. It was just there as a reference point. Uh, what they're doing wrong with pricing semiconductors and CPUs is, is, is kind of technical, but I would love it if and we've been pressuring them to sort of devote some resources to actually go back to the old-fashioned hedonics because the old-fashioned way, we still are packing more and more transistors in with every generation. Uh, we're getting better and better battery uh, life uh, out of our devices, and now we're moving into system on a chip where we're getting better and better communications that are tied in with everything else. There's no doubt that the chips and the computers that people build with them are getting more and more powerful. That's left out right now in some of these calculations. Now, we import so much of computer systems from Asia that it doesn't necessarily translate to a big increase in American productivity, but it's a big increase in world productivity that's not being measured right now. Nice. Uh, I want to give as many people as possible a chance to ask questions. Next one. One of the issues that the panel discussed was housing, and in particular in the Bay Area. And for those of us who live in an apartment, one issue that's top of mind is rent control. As economists, I can guess which side of the debate you would fall on, but um, I'd still love to hear your thoughts, in particular in how it affects people in low-paying jobs. Do we have anyone who has at least a corner of your mind that's open to rent control? <laughs> well, actually, I can make a case. I mean, eight, eight out of ten Singaporeans live in public housing. I'm almost certain you don't know that. And they come in very different tiers. But there is, it's not, I don't, I wouldn't call it exactly rent control. But in a way, it is a single supplier who sets the prices. And um, it actually works very well for them. Because... Housing costs are kept affordable and they have more money to take vacations and do things? Or because 
What, how, how do you know it works well for you? Uh, because of the fact that I think, how does it work well for them? I think they have the kind of housing that you would, in a way, it looks like they are able to shape the housing in a way that's more dense than many other cities that grow without a, 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 a distance. And I think um, perhaps we hear a little bit less about Singapore and housing issues than we do here from New York or London. OK, so they've been able to have great prosperity without yeah. pricing people out of the market. No. Uh, OK, now that we've defended the progressive side, let's come back to the, you know, one, one of you is going to want to chime in on why rent control is, you know, well, I, I, of course, there's a supply phenomenon, that, uh, but, but we haven't done a very good job in dealing with supply anyway for, for the reasons I alluded to earlier. I think you can make a case for uh, compensation. So if you value your apartment at uh, you know, whatever, uh, $10,000 a year, and somebody comes in and say, I'll give you, I'll give you a uh, you know, $15,000 check to, to move out, yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe that's improving uh, both sides of the of the of the coin. So I wouldn't be, I, I wouldn't be adverse at all to uh, some kinds of side payments to make the uh, movement less difficult. Uh, that's really just an econo another kind of economic uh, transaction. But I will say that's about the best thing I can say for rent control. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Hi. Uh, thank you. Great discussion. Um, so I'd like to uh, imagine a world in which technology has done its job, uh, in which there's uh, wage equality, in which we've uh, made education more efficient, and the uh, man behind the plow in China is a staff engineer at Google. <laughs> um, so, uh, how does that global economy take shape? Um, how does uh, the uh, middle class wage gap um, get solved in that picture? And how do we measure it? Um, does global net neutrality play a role? Um, I'm trying to get a, a global picture of, uh, there's a huge globalization that's happening because of technology. And I'd like to get your thoughts on how that takes shape. Well, that, that, uh, that global revolution is, uh, has two sides to it. We often hear this statistic that uh, the median wage hasn't increased in whatever, 15 years or whatever the number is. But at the same time, it's also true that a billion people have been lifted out of, of poverty at a global level. So there's been a huge reduction in uh, global inequality simply from the fact that China join the rest of the, uh, of the industrial world. And that's been a very profound uh, effect. So uh, it's, it, you know, we tend to focus on the negative things because we want to fix the negative things, but there have been so many positive things that have happened with respect to technological advancement and healthcare and uh, global uh, politics that uh, you know, I, I remain optimistic for the future. Great, next question. Uh, going back to sustainability, um, given kind of the human footprint is going upward and the resources are going down and problems like carbon pollution, it seems like pricing externalities, kind of economics 101, would be a growth business. I'm curious how easy that is to do in a, just a pure economic sense, how dynamic they have to be, because if you set a price, but then one year later it's the wrong price, you're, you're either under or overpriced the externality. So I'm curious how much thought's going into that, and then if you uh, have any advice on the political side, how there could be a political process that actually deals with that, that'd be great too. Thank you. The, let, me, let me tackle part of that. In most of the notions of pricing externalities, um, there would be an open market that would be with constantly changing prices. Um, there, there are such things in places where there are, there are some constraints where you basically need emission licenses, for example, but you can sell the licenses if you like, and there can be a daily price. One of the challenges in some of those markets is that they're not necessarily, uh, they could be too thin. The local utility could actually have a lot of market power and could realize that their actions are affecting the price and pricing systems work best when 
firms act as if, when everyone acts as if they don't have control or influence over price, uh, which would be naive for the local utility to believe. Uh, but you, would, you wouldn't have this problem of being locked into a price. You'd have constantly changing, changing prices. Uh, cap and trade, which would have enabled uh, markets like that to, to develop, was pretty, well, you, there's an argument in, among the Democrats and Republicans about how solid the opposition was against it, but there was a filibuster that effectively killed it. And even in gatherings of uh, business economists, uh, I find that some business economists think that cap and trade is just another excuse for the government to raise taxes. So I think we have, a, we have some effort to remind people that these are tools that could be used to bring about a more efficient outcome. And if, very quickly, um, Abe, I think even if we won't get the pricing perfectly right, I think it still is an area worth experimenting simply because of the fact that I think in these kind of areas, I think energy efficiency being an example, unless you price the externality, you really won't get the, the end results. And one of in our past research, when we have looked at carbon, carbon growth, it is pretty clear that ex ante estimates of the cost of any kind of abatement are almost always, I'm not, I don't know of any case where this would have been different, that the, the abatement costs are actually much lower than was anticipated because of the fact that when, you, when people start doing it, there is um, a lot of innovative ways you can address it that we couldn't really think of them before. Next question. Uh, just in terms of uh, the economy and in terms of productivity in the United States, um, what would each of you see as the, the biggest challenge to, to improvement and why? Like, what would you change? For me, by far the biggest opportunity is healthcare and public sector. These are industries where we haven't seen productivity growth, where we haven't implemented a lot of the best practices if you want, or even better practices, that really is by far the biggest opportunity out there. Don't we have the counter tug that these are sort of job maintenance industries? I mean, certainly government, there's not a lot of rewards for shrinking payroll, and as much as there are periodic efforts to shrink, it's also the employer of last resort. I love that you raised that, because that is an argument that assumes that all productivity gains are actually reducing people. Clearly, when you look at historically, actually, roughly half of, of, of productivity growth, growth comes from efficiency gains, which means that we basically need fewer people to do the same thing. Half of it comes from the fact that the same people do new things, do different things, do better. So in many ways, it is that kind of, that side of, I'm not arguing for declining employment in any of these things. I'm really um, arguing for bringing in some of those ways in which the output that each one of those individuals generates, it's much higher. And I think there would be huge benefits of that because it would probably not reduce employment in some of these sectors, but it, was, it would slow down the growth rate of the, of the employment in these sectors, Perfect. which we may need because of the demographics. Mm -hmm. so, so I want to come back to measurement problems. Two thirds of the economy are services. Many of the things you just mentioned, government, employment, healthcare, involve a heavy service component. And, uh, and we're terrible at measuring productivity of services because yeah. you see, you can see when the service quality is improved, but it's very hard to find it in the statistics. So uh, I think if we came up with some better ways to measure this, we would be able to improve our understanding of uh, productivity in the service sector. Uh, yeah, I might make the argument that one of the things that's impeding productivity growth, the part of it that we can measure, is the political impasse. And it's not just in the US, there are, there are more contentious political and military disputes going on around the world. And I wonder how much of that it was sort of, could be explained by the fact that we went through a terrible financial crisis. We had a very bad worldwide synchronized uh, deep recession. Uh, you know, at, for a while, Europe thought it was gonna escape the worst of it. They, they, they got affected somewhat later. Um, but I think in, in the sort of, you know, the book, This Time is Different by Rogoff and Reinhardt, that it sort of warned people that, this is, that there are these exceptional dislocations and economic events that are very hard to recover from. I can't remember if it's in, in their book whether they address this issue or not, but one of the things I think you get is political instability. And I think we're getting a political impasse. Um, nothing sounds like a good idea if it comes from the opposition. And that makes it very hard to to get the system working smoothly enough so that some of the strengths that are already in the economy can have an effect. Uh, I'll just mention one thing, that in the 1930s, which you know, we know there's, there's actually economists argue about how 
how depressed the U.S. economy was through the 30s. There were some years where there was quite healthy growth. But during that overall terrible time, the foundations seemed to be laid for very high productivity uh, in the 50s and 60s. And no one at, at the time probably would have said, we're living in a marvelous time. But there were problems, the railroads, the highway systems, the logistics of moving things by trucks. A lot, a lot of these things got worked out in the 1930s. And Alexander Field has written quite a lot right, about this. Right, yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking of. Great. Next question. Yes. <clears throat> it's been said that productivity in the United States since about 2005 or so increased about 30%. And yet the distribution of the benefits of that seems to be concentrated in a very small percentage of the population, as opposed to the 20th century, from say 1950 to the next 40 years, it was fairly distrib distributed amongst uh, the large population. Do you have any comments about why that is occurring? It's a, it's a question of where the anomaly is. If you look at the 19th century, the uh, wealth distribution towards the end, uh, and income distribution towards the end of the 19th century was far more unequal than we see now in almost every country. And then during the 20th century, as you, as you correctly pointed out, we saw quite a bit of, of uh, income leveling and a rise of a, of a robust middle class and so on. During the last few years, we have seen uh, we have seen an increase in, uh, in in income inequality in the U.S., and my view is most people look at their own prospects. If they see growth in their income or their family's income, and they believe their children have better lives, they're willing to tolerate a pretty high level of inequality as long as things are getting better. And then we hit this recession you're talking about, where things didn't get better; things got worse for many people. And, uh, and, and the income growth stagnated, and then you've had this inequality rise to, uh, to a much higher uh, point in people's thinking than it did before. I believe if we do see growth resume and economic forces uh, revive, uh, as they seem to be doing now, we will see less of a focus on the inequality issue. I think it's due to relatively special circumstances, and it's not unlike uh, Piketty. I'm not, uh, I'm not a believer in the theory that this is uh, a force of, of the economy. It's simply a uh, reaction to a certain uh, set of great new technologies that came on, and people who are able to uh, exploit those technologies and manage them on a world stage ended up doing extremely well but we're not going to see that happen uh, every decade the way it, uh, it happened in the last few decades. I surely hope you are right. However, I do worry. I think there are, we, have, we talk a lot about technology and globalization, which don't worry me, frankly. Mm -hmm. What worries me is the third part of, of the uh, division in the economy, which is kind of the shift in the demand. As we have become richer, we consume more services. As we become older, we consume more services. These are industries that are labor intensive, where average productivity is lower and average wages are lower. At the same time, we see the fastest productivity growth, all the excitement happening in manufacturing, tech-enabled sectors more broadly in services, and those are industries where employment is actually declining. So we are seeing a real, uh, real diversification in where the jobs are coming from. And in the past, we have typically seen that the productivity gains are translated into demand for new kinds of goods and services, new kinds of occupations. In the last 25 years, a third of all new jobs in the US have come from occupations that barely existed 25 years ago. It's not just from con con uh, computer programmers and computer uh, systems analysts, it's also uh, fitness instructors and medical technicians, etc. It is, in a way, unless we see that demand continuing to create those new jobs, we, I'm a little worried that the past performance and our capacity to do that may not be an indication of future returns, as the financial sector tends to say. In a way, that's something to watch, and it's the only thing that worries me. Technology and globalization don't worry me. And remember that Piketty uh, argues that there's something inevitable. Uh, the the, the um, R greater than G equation, which I understand you'll, inequality, which I think I heard you'll see on 
sweatshirts in Washington, D.C. now, um, <laughs> that that's uh, caused this concent increasing concentration. And unless we really radically change the system, it will inevitably continue. Early, early uh, answers by people who have tried to repeat some of his work have made some people say it's, uh, that it's neither necessary nor sufficient. You can run some of the models that are respected, and you can get uh, that this is not necessarily a permanent factor that, that we're responsible that we that we're stuck with. I do think to tie it into the topic of technology, there is a question of what, whether the technological advances are very valuable to some people and not very valuable to others, and so that they're allowing people who are who are in uh, very advantaged positions to use the technological innovation to, to make a lot more money. And that may be, that's of course what the critics of the financial system have said in but some that, cases. That should be a diffusion issue, that there are people right. who will take advantage of it in years one through five, but by years 20 to 30, it ought to spread. I, I think you're right. I also think that services, I think computerization is going to have major, help cause major improvements in services, whether it's your being better informed when you go in to see a physician, uh, whether it's uh, software to remind you where you left the darn keys when you went in, so you, as, as we have an aging population, you don't have people being as frustrated about, mm -hmm. about the fact that they may not remember these things. It's all, it's all an app away from, the solutions are all an app away don't, in many don't cases. Don't forget the impact of Match.com and eHarmony. Right, exactly. <laughs> Uh, we have time for two more questions. Okay, uh, I'd like to uh, shift the focus a little bit to uh, <clears throat> to the developing world outside of the United States, and particularly to Yana. Question: I think you mentioned that a large fraction of productivity is transferred through dissemination of best practice, and then you made a statement also that was interesting of uh, that we focused on earlier about the environment around uh, places that are productive, particularly cities. So uh, my question is, has McKinsey done, or, or anyone else on the panel perhaps, done mm. any work to understand what fraction of the dissemination of technological change, and uh, therefore productivity, actually is channeled into the public sector in cities, between cities, cities themselves picking up new ideas, like uh, not driverless cars perhaps, but bus rapid transit systems, which are kind of a 19th century version of you know, a technological improvement in infrastructure. Uh, things like that, Jana, do, do we have any numbers that help us understand whether cities are going to be playing more of a role in this productivity uh, exchange and dissemination? Great question. That happens to be very close to my heart because I have spent a good part of the last five years studying cities and mapping them globally. And I think it is, cities are a very hot topic. They talk about the century of cities. There is a sense that nations are the past of the last two centuries and this century is about the cities. And I think there is a lot of discussions and a lot of exchange and a lot of cities actually thinking themselves as relatively independent. So for example, even the World Economic Forum, who I was stunned to read this, but they suggested some of the local governments, regional and cities, they should think about their trade policies independently, which is something that's happening in, in Brazil already, already. So there definitely is a lot of uh, information transfer. A lot of the innovations are coming from the emerging world, including the rapid, uh, bus rapid transit systems. They really have been, have, been, have been spreading around. I think cities have particularly hard challenges on the political side as well. They tend to be very fragmented. You have a single center city and lots of other cities around, and they don't necessarily have an integrated way to, to make decisions, etc. So I think the challenges that we saw in the national arena have not gone away. But I think this is where a lot of excitement is happening, both on the diffusion side as well as on the technological innovation. Great. And our last question of the night, although the panelists should be available afterward as well. Uh, yes. Uh, so we started a bit talking about a technological singularity and uh, the potential for concentration of wealth, and we've, we've touched on it. Um, and you know, maybe in like five, ten years, there'll be there'll be enough production to, to match for everyone, but really not distribution of, of resources. Um, can you talk about your long-term vision for like the job market and, and where you see jobs being when there's so much wealth, but it's really not uh, distributed and it's concentrated? Uh, well, you know, the the paradox here is everybody wants uh, less work but more jobs, <laughs> and. Uh, this idea that the robots are going to come and take away our jobs seems to me to be uh, vastly overblown for, for the reasons I mentioned earlier. We've seen this happen with many kinds of technology. They haven't, uh, they haven't destroyed jobs, they typically destroyed work. 
uh, in the sense that people can lead more creative, better lives because you've offloaded these, uh, these unpleasant tasks to uh, computers. And if you look at the work of uh, David Autor, which I think is, is very uh, perceptive, he looks at the kind of hollowing out of the uh, labor force. The very high skilled people are doing fine. Actually, the people at the low end of the uh, economy, the gardeners and the truck drivers and so on, are doing uh, fine, r relatively speaking. But it's those middle semi-skilled occupations where it's really difficult. And there, I think, you need, we, you know, having a, having a better education system really helps there. But it isn't just at the high end. I mean, having better training, better skill acquisition, uh, better ways to uh, to do useful jobs at the uh, low end is going to be critically uh, important. Anyone else want to take a shot at it? Um, I think on, and where jobs are going to come from for the last 50 years, manufacturing jobs have been declining, services have been increasing, and of the developed world in general, actually the net growth is equal to the growth in the non-market sectors, which is healthcare, education, um, government, and social services. So in a way, if you believe in those trends that are actually pretty consistent across the board, um, that's where the jobs are going to come from. The one thing we haven't mentioned here, however, is exactly what you're talking about, leisure. When you look at over the last um, decades, we have seen a very significant decline in the average hours worked. So for the, all the countries that we have data for, it has been a seven hour decline. We now work roughly 34 hours on average. But in places like France and Germany, you have seen a decline of 13 hours. And when you account for the yearly vacations, they work 28 hours roughly uh, per week. So it's a very dramatic change. In the US, that has been much less, from 36 to 33 hours. So it's a three hour, de a three hour, hour decline. But I think as we, as we see the labor markets evolve, we will probably see hours adjust somewhat, somewhat as the leisure time becomes more valuable when we all have YouTube and the local <laughs> yoga club and the video games to spend our time on. And so we have something to do when we're stuck in traffic. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. One thing I would say, if you're successful in your hopes for your career, you're probably going to have to find your own job. And it's probably going to be more than one job during your lifetime. And I, the, the idea that you have to go into a particular industry, in some cases you know, for a long time, if it, you, you wanted to stay where you were, you had to work for a particular company. A lot of those employ, employers doing things like um, Garment workers and so on. A lot of those have closed in have, have closed down in the advanced economies. They've moved to places like Bangladesh. That doesn't work anymore. And and I know it, it's part of what I said. It can be exhausting the vision of how you have to constantly be learning and redefining yourself. But I think that's what the world is like right now. Fantastic. Thanks for coming. our speakers for sharing your insights with us so freely. We really appreciate it. And George for leading this conversation so well. As a very small token of our appreciation, we have for you a couple things in a gift bag here, including a Churchill Club speaker t-shirt. Wow. <laughs> and a surprise from Wharton, San Francisco. Thank you, Tiffany. And the cigar you asked for? Yes. The yes. Cigar um, for this, this program will be on view on the Churchill Club YouTube channel. <laughs> probably tomorrow, but within the next 48 hours. And where you can also find other uh, recordings of our program. So I hope that you go and take advantage of that. And please join us now for coffee dessert conversation and a beautiful view of the Bay Bridge here at Wharton, San Francisco. And you have been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. See you next time. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really